Hello, everybody. Welcome to another uh, social distancing social from uh, Future Tense, which is a partnership of uh, Slate, New America, and Arizona State University, as I uh, need to remind you. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about the role. Well, first, I, I guess I should again introduce myself again. I'm Jordan Weissman, Slate Senior Business and Economics Correspondent. Um, and we're going to be talking about the role of the private sector in times of crisis, because we're in a crisis. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, it's we're in a pretty bad crisis. Uh, we're facing unemployment unseen since the Great Depression and a uh, plague all at once. It's a little bit of a nasty combo. Um, and so I am joined by Rebecca Henderson, a uh, professor at Harvard Business School, uh, who has a recent book, Reimagine Capitalism in a World on Fire, um, in which she argues that capitalism sort of needs to be rethought Businesses need to change the way they act in a world facing environmental catastrophe and uh, spiraling inequality. Um, I am also joined by uh, Dean Sanjeev Kagram, uh, Dean and Director General of the Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University. Uh, Sanjeev and Rebecca, uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having us. Um, Rebecca, I want to start by uh, directing a question to you right now. Um, and you're Picture is a little frozen. Are, are, are I think are you there with us right now? No, oh, I think we've lost Rebecca at the moment. There seems to have been some technical difficulties. So Sanjeev, uh, it's you and I talking for the moment. Okay, uh, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> we can adapt. <laughs> we can. Yeah, no, if the people doing uh, yeah, <laughs> if, if Broadway stars doing uh, you know a a if, doing improvisation, a, yeah, <laughs> got to do a tribute to. Uh, you know, company or whatnot and, and deal with technical difficulties. So can we. So you yes. are, um, Thunderbird is all about change. You teach about how to deal with change, how to, oh, Rebecca, you're back. <laughs> <laughs> all all right. right, go back over. <laughs> are we good? Do we, yeah, right. this is, this is, this is life in the era of COVID and, and maybe the future after COVID. We're going to talk about that. Is this, is this, is this what we are all bound to be doing for the rest of our lives as workers? Um, so, Rebecca, um, you wrote a whole book about uh, cap how capitalism needs to change to deal with the various um, horror, parade of horrors that we're dealing with, from climate change to inequality. Um, do you, th first, I have a question. How, you know, specifically, kind of give me an overview of, of the ways you thought capitalism needed to change. And does the crisis that we are now facing make that more or less likely, that that is going to happen, in your opinion? Are we going to see the change we need? I thought that capitalism was wildly unbalanced. I'm a huge fan of capitalism. I teach at the Harvard Business School. I think it's an unparalleled source of prosperity, but we were going in a bad direction. How could you tell? We weren't dealing with the environmental crisis, particularly climate change. The prosperity that we were generating was not being shared anything like widely. And our political systems were starting to shake under the strain. Um, and there was a widespread perception, in fact, here in the US that the political system was rigged, that nothing they, people could do would make a difference, creating all kinds of institutional pressures. So it felt to me as if capitalism was wildly out of balance. I like to say that free markets need free politics. As much as business people don't, don't care much for regulators or government, they need them. And I think what uh, the pandemic has shown us is that that is true in spades. I mean, inequality has become much more visible. We've seen the essential workers not being able to take time off, if, even if they're sick. And we've seen that, yes, you need a federal government, that the failure of the federal government to step up and act as a coordinative unit to provide a public good is a huge problem. So I think the pandemic has really thrown a spotlight on, on our problems in a way that, you know, people say, how did you know to call it reimagining capitalism in a world on fire? Well, the world was on fire beforehand. It's just burning a little harder right now. Yeah, right. Previously, California was literally, and Australia were literally on yeah, fire. Absolutely. Now it's, now we're dealing with, now we're, de we're dealing with a different plague. Well, now actual plague, <laughs> a, di a different horrible misfortune. Um, I, I want to come back to um, this question of whether or not businesses are, or kind of the corporate community is learning that change really needs to happen, or if it 
maybe is getting the opposite lesson. I, I want to come back to that, but say, but before we get deep into that, the, the weeds there, Sajib, I want to ask, ask you, you, you know, you're, um, you, 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 you guys at Thunderbird very much believe that we are heading for, or we're heading for an era of rapid change that businesses either technologically because of te technology or politics needed to kind of rethink the way they were going to be working. I, and I was hoping rather than me put words in your mouth, A, you could kind of give me, you know, the elevator pitch version of, of the change that you, you foresaw. And also how is this pandemic possibly going to change that or uh, alter the course of that change? Well, I want to just say that I, I very much agree with Rebecca's analysis. And that's where we, you know, I took over Thunderbird two years ago. And as I, uh, have said again and again, there are three fundamental challenges slash opportunities and they're very much aligned with what Rebecca said. The first one is globalization and the uh, sort of the, the, the rise of nationalism and the populisms which are connected to that inequalities that Rebecca was talking about. Absolutely, right? Globalization was incredibly successful in terms of lifting lots of people out of poverty, incredible transformation, but there was a lot of undersides and inequality was a major fundamental part of that. The second is the sustainability of the planet. Again, Wood, Rebecca, I want to just confirm exactly. Climate change, you know, we're talking about the Australian fires. My partner's Australian. We were actually there during the fires. That feels like a decade ago. Uh, now that we're in go, you know what I mean? Because, you know, we were there watching this thing in Victoria and, and you know, literally family members' uh, houses going on fire. So, you know, absolutely. Whether it's definitely climate change, but the sixth extinction, one could go on and on and on. But, but the, for me the, and us, the optimistic side or the, the potential side, possible side, was the fourth industrial revolution with all of its challenges uh, was still that. This cascading set of technologies, AI, internet of things, 3D printing, on and on and on. Um, and how do we maximize the benefits of this fourth industrial revolution, uh, learning from the previous three and minimize its cost, the issues of privacy and cyber and all the other things that we know. Uh, to advance a sustainable, equitable prosperity. So very much, again, in line with what Rebecca was saying. And our view was pre-COVID uh, that that had to do with um, having three things. One was a new set of sort of global leaders and managers that could both um, embrace, have what we called a digital global mindset. A global mindset is something for us where it's, uh, um, it's actually actual inventory and intellectual, social, and psychological uh, proclivities, fluencies for bringing the world together, for working across cultures, across borders, and so forth and so on. A second is a real uh, digital uh, sort of sensibility. Not everyone has to be a Python expert, but they have everyone in our view in the global business sector, let's focus on that since that's the focus, has to be able to embrace these new tech technologies, understand how they work and what their upsides and downsides are and be able to work them. And then a third is a re, uh, and this is again very much aligned, a recalibration of the social contract for business and society. And uh, in particular, a new kind of um, uh, approach to cross-sectoral sort of private, public, civil society relations. And we focus particularly that at the global level where global cooperation, as we know, over the last five years has really declined dramatically. The pandemic is a perfect example of it where we don't have the kind of global cooperation we had during uh, the global financial economic crisis with the G20 and so forth. So that's really, you know, those are the fundamental building blocks. Uh, and COVID, as I've written about and I believe strongly, is only, uh, I think Rebecca agrees, accelerated these transformations and put them into sharp relief. So I, I want to connect something you both kind of touched on, which is this idea of recalibrating the social contract. That's something, again, there, there needs to be we need to rethink the relationship between business and government or public and private sector. But, you know, Rebecca, you said that you feel like the COVID has sort of highlighted the need for that, that it's it sort of um, brought that into even sharper relief than it was before. But let me put on my cynics hat here, right? If I'm, let me put on a cynics hat. If I'm a Fortune 500 CEO, what I see has just happened is that Congress, you know, in the United States, we had a pandemic and there was a late response. But Congress eventually passed a two point, you know, $2 trillion bill that allowed the Federal Reserve, among other things, to start to stabilize the entire corporate debt market and make sure that large corporations were going to be able to float through this. Even if business is bad, they're going to survive. Stocks are up. 
Um, and while the rest of the bailout might not exactly be doing what it's supposed to, big business is going to survive and it's going to come out of this okay. Isn't, isn't it possible that one lesson that corporations are going to learn is actually the social contract is working pretty well for them, even when things get, get bad? No. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, tell me why the cynic here is wrong. <laughs> What we're seeing, I think, is a continuation of business as usual before the pandemic, which okay. is a nasty tendency for business to be able to privatize the upside and socialize the downside. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, what we've seen is, that's a little harsh for what just happened. I think it's been very hard for a government to let the large corporations go down. Mm -hmm. or to let the credit markets go down, the knock-on effects on the rest of the economy would be huge. Mm -hmm. I think if I'm a CEO, I'm not saying, oh, this shows all right, all's right with the world. I think CEOs take, the big CEOs take it completely for granted. Mm -hmm. Of course our stability is warranted. Of course they stabilize the credit market. Whoa, we still have a very serious problem. Mm -hmm. These are small things, but do you remember in the early days of the pandemic, we had billionaires tweeting from their yacht, here I am, uh, you know, sheltering in place on my yacht in the Grenadines. I, yes, um, I, do, I do recall the super yachts. <laughs> trust, in, trust in business has fallen significantly over the pandemic. If you look at the latest Edelman survey, trust in business is, in government is way up. Trust in business is way down. The mm -hmm. perception that the rich are sitting on their yachts making out like bandits while I am delivering food on the front lines without bonus pay, without health care, mm -hmm. that perception has got stronger. And mm -hmm. every CEO I know is, is worried about it. It used to be tough for me to sometimes raise these issues of inequalities with business people. Now it's easy. Now it's clearly top of mind. So no, I don't think they feel more relaxed. I think they feel more jumpy. Interesting. Is there, since, since you said that you've, you've talked to CEOs who are more worried, can you, can you, can you give me some anonymous samples of the kinds of things you've heard from them? Like what, what are they, what are they telling you? Being, are they, are they fearing the pitchforks? Is it? <laughs> being, being, so it used to be when I said, yeah. if we don't address these problems, we face either right wing or left wing populism and both of them end in extraction and you're not going to like that. Mm -hmm. People used to look at me like, whoa, whoa, slow down, Henderson, what are you thinking? Now people go, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a very different response. Mm -hmm. that, that idea that, no, seriously, that the system may be fundamentally at risk. And I think, too, to be fair, a lot of business people are very distressed by what they're seeing, um, that seeing this kind of widespread um, in a, unemployment, seeing people struggle, seeing the visceral problem of what it's like to be trying to survive at the bottom of the income distribution. You know, most CEOs spend a lot of time in bubbles, very nicely lined bubbles working incredibly hard. And I think one of the things the pandemic has done is shatter that bubble just a little bit to sort of have a broader engage, uh, a thought of what's going on. Um, and that's, sorry. I'll okay. stop. I can okay. keep going. I'm an academic. I'll stop. Well, no. So this is actually, this is interesting because what, I'm going to try to translate a little bit what, you know, um, what, what I think you're saying and then uh, kind of turn it back over to the dean. But, you know, I think a lot of critics of contemporary capitalism will, will say that there used to be this mentality in the United States that even though there were class divides, there, there was still sort of a, a, a humanity of purpose that everyone understood there was like a, we we're all part of a civil society, right? And that was sort of born out of wartime, that there were some, you know, there were, there were connections between the guy running GM and his workers. Um, and it sounds like what you're saying is, and that they all needed the system to work for anyone to kind of thrive. And what it sounds like you're saying is that we're kind of going through a wartime experience now in a way that's making people realize, oh, we all need a system that benefits everyone or, it's all going to fall apart. It's going to be in trouble. Is that is that a, a, a that, that we're kind of getting a taste of life during wartime? Is is that a, a maybe a, a thing to? I think Rebecca may have been lost again. I think we've we've lost her. I think we've lost her feed. So um, unfortunately, technical difficulties strike again. But um, Sanjeev, I, I guess let me let me then ask you. You mentioned that um, you think there needs to be 
a change in the social contract between business and the public sector or, or wider society. And that's sort of what Rebecca's talking about, is there needs to be a change in the social contract. That, and now this is sort of an aha moment for a lot of CEOs. What, what are you imagining this change would look like? What, how, how does the, the compact underpinning business and society need to, to change? And Yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, I, I appreciate, uh, Jordan, the focus on CEOs. And I appreciate the focus on the U.S., but I, I want to be a little bit provocative here and actually push us out of that because we have a tendency to look at everything from the United States and from the most powerful within U.S. corporations. And the world has changed dramatically I, over the last I, 25 I'm, years, I'm, right? I'm at heart a very provincial New Yorker. So, that's, that's... <laughs> so I'm going to pull you out of New York. I grew yeah. up in New Jersey, but I was born in New Bedford. So we are a global school. I just was on a webinar, a webinar with Kenyan uh, head of uh, the Kenyan Securities Exchange, the head of Safaricom this morning, CEOs around the world. We've had Globinars with CEOs from all over the world and companies from all over the world. We have to, we have to kind of take what's happening and let's look at what's happening in terms of global capitalism right now. Look yeah. at China right now. Just the, the engine of globalism for the la globalization for the last 25 years. That system is, no matter how much, you know, people try to wrap around this, we know right now that it's, it's, it's shaky at best. Mm -hmm. The sinophobia that exists in the world amongst the private sector as much as governments around the world is at all time peaks. The push to move to decentralize or diversify the global supply chains, either bring them back on shore to the United States or Europe or wherever it might be, or more importantly, to take it elsewhere to India, to wherever it might be. That's a fundamental driver that's happening right now. And COVID has just you know, kind of rip the Band-Aid off completely, right? Yeah. Now, let's go back to what's happening in terms of, of corporate CEOs. If you look, you know, I talk to them like Rebecca does, but look at their, if you look at the confidence surveys, six months ago, they're all thinking, you know, we're going to go to a soft landing in the global economy, but we're still going to be fine. We're still going to make lots of money, our companies and us individually. Now, if you look at, it's very variable. I mean, if you look at Australian CEOs, they think we're good, they're going to rebound really well. That's partly because Australia is doing really well, a great job of handling COVID. Obviously, U.S. CEOs are, you know, in despair. We had the Boeing CEO on come on today earlier, right, uh, um, Rebecca, saying, you know, we're looking at airlines going away. So yeah. despite your previous question about the $2.2 .2 trillion package and more to come that was, quote, unquote, could be seen as bailouts for companies, in fact, there's going to be fundamental transformation, disruption in industry, in the U.S. including. So, one, let's take a global perspective and see how it's, you know, capitalism is global, and it's, com and, but, you know, different governance systems, you know, what's happened in Sweden is totally different. <laughs> That's what's happening, you know, uh, yeah. in, in Brazil. Let's look at Brazil. I mean, look at what's happening in Brazil. Totally different. I talk to CEOs in Brazil, and they're in complete despair because, you know, what kind, they were just seeming to get out of what was a doldrums for a long time in Brazil, and now that's completely changed. Given that, we have, what, what we're predicting now is from 200 million unemployment in the world to 400 million. That's the latest ILO figures. Yeah. There's no way that a corporation and a CEO and their board is not looking at that and exactly saying what Catherine, I, I mean, Rebecca is saying. We can't, there's no, we have to fundamentally transform. And we did just, I'll put the last point on this. We did a, a global NR with MUFG, which is the fifth largest bank in the world. We had the CFO, we had all the senior leadership. They instituted pre-COVID compassion training in all of their, with all of their employees around the world. Mm -hmm. um, now they want to be the most trusted bank in the world. Go back to Rebecca, your great point about trust and business sector trust going down and government going up, which, which was different pre-COVID, right? Um, the, the whole focus on trust will require businesses, corporations, and therefore CEOs to make really dramatic shifts in how they engage with customers, with suppliers, with other stakeholders. And we were already talking about this at the World Economic Forum in January when the pandemic was already <laughs> going on and we were all sitting there thinking like nothing's happening. And there it was, we came back and it's a full blown global pandemic. Just the dramatic shift. We went from a, a global economy that we expected to go 3% this year. And now we're down to a negative 3%. It's, yeah. it's a total, the, the terrain is completely shifted and corporations will have to adapt and are adapting. They have to. So I, I want to try and, and 
pin this conversation down to a, a few more specifics. You know, you talk about Rebecca, how, you know, companies realize there's a, a need for the social compact to change in, in some respect to be more open to say regulation. Uh, Sanjeev, you, you, you say that there's a realization amongst the global elite or global business community that things are falling apart and there needs to be a, refit, a big rethinking of, of what the system is going to look like in the future. I guess I want to know from each of you what you think actual, real, constructive change would look like, right? So I want to start with you, Rebecca. What what kind of changes do you think, um, you know, the CEOs or the business leaders you've talked to are actually becoming more amenable to? Like, what do you think that, you know, is it going to change what they lobby for or against? Is it going to change the way they treat workers in some in some significant way? What do you expect? I think we'll see much more interest in high road employment models. Mm -hmm. That is where we treat people with dignity and respect, pay them a decent wage, give them some control over their work, high degrees of job security. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more interest in so-called shared value business models. That mm -hmm. is how do we continue make, to make money, but address some of these social and, econo um, and environmental problems. I think we'll see that accelerate. Mm -hmm. I hope we'll see more collective action among business people, whether it's regionally or at the industry level, because a lot of these kinds of problems are easier to address if business comes together. So um, if we together decide in Minneapolis or we together decide to address the problem of horrible labor regulations in Bangladesh, uh, we'll see an acceleration. I hope, I hope, I hope we'll see the conversation change so that the big business peak associations, the Chamber of Commerce, the Business Roundtable, the ICC, talk much more about business's role as a partner in the broader system than about shareholder value, shareholder value, shareholder value. I mean, returning adequate returns to investors is important, got to keep the company going. But the point of the business should be, I think, generally acknowledged to be playing a role in this larger system. And, mm -hmm. and hands in a very concrete, tangible way. And Sanjeev, I, I, you know, similar question for you. Um, you're talking about an even broader group, like the global business community. I mean, well, you're both talking about the global community, but you know, what, when you say that there's a recognition that the system isn't working and that there needs to be change, what kind of specific concrete things do you think that they, you know, we're we talking about new kind of global business governments or, or governance organizations or, or what, what, what do you imagine in your mind's eye? So uh, there's what, what is normatively desirable and then there's what's probable and possible, right? So yeah. in terms of what's normatively desirable is a fundamental rethinking of global governance where global business plays as, you know, uh, Rebecca was starting to intimate a much more fundamental role in creating new forms of public private partnerships that re redoes very concretely refashion the, the, the sort of social contract. Now, look, even, I guess, I think one thing just to add though, um, Jordan, is that Corporations, um, we're going to within the business sector, within industry, we're going to see the rise and decline of different sectors and within that different corporations. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a, quite a shakeout. Overall, my prediction is, in fact, that the corporate sector is going to be much weaker relative to pre COVID to post COVID. And in fact, we're going to have uh, a new wave of small, medium-sized business, entrepreneurship, innovation, so forth and so on. And that's really going to drive the global economy going forward. That's, and that's going to fundamentally change the power balance in, in terms of the private sector. So that's just a, that's, just a prediction that I'm making right that, that's now. That's really interesting. I actually want to, I, I want to push you a little bit on that because a lot of people right now, if you talk to like, you know, kind of policy wonk types, right, in Washington are worried about the exact opposite. That right now what we're seeing is a brush fire that's going to wipe out small entrepreneurs and small businesses and startups and only leave the big sequoias, right? Like the big, the, the, for, the fortune 500 kind of companies standing. Yeah. Um, and that it's actually going to be sort of, it's going to, you know, whatever trends there were towards concentration and monopolization of markets, it's going to accelerate. You, you actually think it's the opposite. So why, why do you think that's the opposite? Okay. I, I made it. Let me make sure I'm saying it. 
in some sectors, in some sector, sector. for example, you're okay. going to get more concentration and more power. So you're going to okay. get, you know, the Amazons of the world will continue to grow and the Huawei's and so forth. They will, they are the, the winners, right? In this, in this COVID, post COVID world, right? Mm -hmm. But other sectors, airlines, travel, you know, we can go on down the, you know, yeah, uh, entertainment is going to really change. So there's a lot of sectors where mm. companies that were historic household names, air, you know, are not going to be there, are not going to be the powerhouses that they were. Now, within that, then yes, small and medium-sized businesses are hurting not only in the United States but all over the world. But you're gonna, in my view, we're going to see uh, a really fantastic. Hope, uh, I believe, very um, positive and transformative new generation. Mm -hmm. of small and medium it's new startups I, I you know i'm a big fan of entrepreneurship and i think that entrepreneurship and innovation we're already deciding to see it i'm a believer in human ingenuity and i think that the stressors and strains of covid are only going to you know sort of accelerate this and the technologies that we've been talking about are going to empower that the question is is government going to come to the party and really do what they need to do as good partners. And so when we look at these stimulus packages around the world, the sad part in my view is we don't have enough in terms of really focusing on new business generation. We don't have enough in terms of uh, upskilling and reskilling of people that have lost employment or need to get employment. And we don't have enough of a transition to a green economy uh, you know, uh, uh, and green infrastructure, a green new deal. Those three fundamental things that governments need yeah. to take the leadership on, that's not happening. That's where business needs to push and you're, say, this is what these stimulus packages need to have. You, that would you, be my- You're, you're worried that the go governments are wasting a good crisis. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. This is an opportunity for a fundamental transformation mm -hmm. and we're, we're losing this opportunity. Uh, speaking of opportunities, I, I want to uh, remind everyone to uh, send in questions if you have them. Uh, please email them over uh, to, uh, if you've got questions for either of our guests. Um, that would be, you know, we want to hear them. Uh, in a few minutes, uh, once they're emailed over to me, I will, uh, I'll, I'll start asking them. Um, actually, I should really check my email right now to see if any have come in. That's, I, I should... Oh, questions for webinar. Actually, ha, ah, they already started coming in, so I'm behind schedule here. I'm a very professional host, let me tell you. This is, <laughs> this is what it's like listening to me on a podcast, in case anyone here is wondering. Um, so yeah, let me uh, let me let me look. Okay, here's here's actually okay, here's one from Lucas Myers. Um, what are examples of and I some people I think this is probably for you, but we'll see. Um, what are examples of inevitable change that COVID-19 has radically accelerated? What, what, what are things that were already okay. happening that is just definitely are going to come at us faster now? Well, so I think it's going to be two or three. One is, um, look, the move away from physical infrastructure in terms of corporations to, you know, sort of remote working and learning and virtual teams that we're never going back to a world. You know, we, you already see companies, right? I'm sure Rebecca, you're talking to them like I'm talking to them and seeing, they, they're saying we're not, we're reducing our future budgets in terms of new physical infrastructure plants, certainly office buildings and things like that. That's a thing of the past. We can do the, why would we even have people come back when we can work so efficiently this way, reduce costs and stuff like that. So that I think is never so, coming back again. I actually have a, I have a question about that specifically, which is what about the fact that people are going crazy right now, like working from home? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, is this gonna be sort of like the next open office thing where like everyone decides to go to like all digital and everyone's like, I hate this. Like, well, how, why did we decide to start? I mean, really, is this, do, are, 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 are people in, in businesses looking at, at our kind of work arrangements right now and saying, oh yes, this is the future? I, I, I find that a little bit bleak, I have to say. I think Sanjeev is, is, is putting the case a little too strongly. <laughs> um, I think there are some firms that are saying maybe we don't need as much office space as we had. But I think one of the other things that's happening is we're becoming very aware that there are some things you can't do remotely. Yeah. And, uh, and that, that's um, an important part of the puzzle. I mean, I take where you're going, Dean, but... Uh, I don't think we're going to stop building office buildings completely anytime soon. I really don't. Okay, you heard it here. We're uh, going to have a, a respectful disagreement <laughs> where I'm going to say in five, we're going to come back in a year and three years and five years, and I'm going to put some money down on the fact that we're going to have 
okay. massive open office, even more than we already have. And, <laughs> you know, actual investments in new office space is going to grind dramatically. And co-working and shared are, are going to go way up. So people do want to get out of the house, Jordan, going back to your question, but they're not going to go to their offices for their companies, they're going to go to co-working spaces. So right. I see that industry actually going up very strongly. And I'm not saying, so this is, this is the thing, they're going to redirect <laughs> their employees to these co-working spaces, you know, and so that industry, I'd, put, I'd invest in, in those companies for those that be looking for investment options. I, I feel <laughs> like you need to put some skin in the game right now and like, <laughs> and like, <laughs> I only have skill. Deal. That's true. <laughs> no, but there's gonna be like some commercial real estate reach out there that you can try and short, like and just like that's, that'll really mark your mark your market. Um, all right, so that that is one. So the, the that's the, we have some disagreement on the extent, but the, a little at least we're all a little bit more open to the idea of telework. Are there other are there other big trends that either? Well, let, let me have uh, Rebecca yeah. go first. I have a couple of. But I'll let you just, you put one. We can go back and forth and do a little tag. Yeah, Rebecca, what's another one that you see coming? Oh, massive investment in biomed. Okay. Um, I sit on the board of Amgen and I spent 10 years of my life studying pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. But I think the last 20 years have been all about IT and digitization. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, yeah. that continues to be incredibly important. I completely agree that's going to transform things. But I think this is really the age of biomed. And it's kind of, it's a Sputnik moment for bi biomed. Uh, we're going to see lots of children go into biology. We're going to see lots more biological engineering, uh, a lot more tracking. I think it's very striking. Privacy preferences are really shifting. So I think we'll see much more biometric uh, tracking, much more physical tracking. I think we, oh no, we, wait, oh wait, you're back. Okay, good. Yeah, for a second we thought, I thought we lost you there again. I was, I was nervous. That, that's interesting though, especially, you know, if, if we do actually at any point manage to get a, a test and, and trace uh, regime up and running in the US, you, you would expect people to eventually get more comfortable with the idea of tracking, um, you know, like they are in, in much of uh, East Asia, for instance, it's, it's less of a, I guess less of a cultural issue there, and it, it might change here as well. So I, I could I could definitely see the contours of how that would happen. Um, what uh, what what's another what's another trend that we could I can put money on? <laughs> <laughs> you go ahead. You do one more, Rebecca. Then I'll jump in. Okay, Rebecca, one more from you. One more for sure. Yeah, for sure. Whoa, for sure, for sure. So I'm going to go out on a limb. Okay. I'm going to say I think that big finance is going to be even more focused on climate change than it was before. Really? There oh. was a gathering movement to suggest that climate change was potentially a catastrophic risk to the financial system. Mm -hmm. I think the people who control a huge proportion of the world's invested assets had come to the reluctant conclusion. That, and I think what the pandemic has done is remind us that disasters can really happen. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been talking to CEOs who said, I used to manage my supply chain for cost and efficiency. Going forward, I'm going to have to manage for risk. Interesting. And so I think we're certainly going to see a much more focus on risk is the most obvious one. But I expect big finance not to back off on pushing on climate, but to in fact um, increase and speed up and indeed everyone to think about their businesses from as much a risk perspective as a drive the cost to the lowest common denominator. That's part of the deglobalization that Sanjeev talked about, but mm -hmm. I think it's broader than that. Willing to pay to avoid certain kinds of risks. Are you also, are you kind of gesturing towards like the BlackRock effect here, like the Larry Flink, oh no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Larry Flink, Jesus. Uh, Larry Flink, um, like, you know, kind of sustainability, uh, push for sustainability. Is, is that kind of, you, are, are you saying that's sort of going to be more serious? Now? That's exactly where I'm, that's exactly where I'm going. I mean, the technical term for Larry Rock's customers, the people who are pushing him, yeah. are universal owners. You know, people like uh, Hiro Mizuna, who was run the Japanese government 
the pension fund, one yeah. percent of all the world's equities. For him, he can't diversify away from the risk of climate change, or indeed the risk of social um, social unrest. Yeah. So he sees it, or so it is his fiduciary duty to push this, mm -hmm. and he's one of the people who's pushing Larry. So absolutely, that's where I'm gesturing. I, you know, I used to be really skeptical about the the impact of. Uh, those sorts of corporate sustainability initiatives and and what you know or groups like BlackRock were doing, but recently, um, actually, uh, some Republicans in Congress have started to get worried about it and have started talking about the idea of of uh, financial managers uh, discriminating against uh, oil fossil fuel companies, and uh -huh. so that's what that gave me a sense. Once once the GOP is freaking out, it actually gave me a sense. Maybe there's something to this. It, there might actually be a, a serious a, a serious issue to consider here. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, and so you're, and so there's, yes. we're going for one more, one more, uh, one more kind of guaranteed trend that's heading, that, that's coming at us. Okay, so I'm going to give you two or three. Well, number one, uh, it used to, we used to think, depending on how you look at the data, China's already the world's largest economy, purchasing power parity. You know, let's say that it's not. Uh, with COVID, the prediction is that in the next two years, China will be the, the, the world's largest economy. Yeah, and with that, there will be the uh, 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 you know associated flexing of power, mm -hmm. and depending on particularly the U.S. election, um, you know the potential for as we know even exact further exacerbated uh, China-U.S. relations and what that would the cascading effect mm -hmm. of that, uh, and on the on the Chinese side, even a more aggressive uh, attempt to shape the international order, and I, with. No norm. I'm not making a judgment that that's good or bad. I'm just that's kind of just a. I I think that that's almost a guarantee that we're headed that way. It, the U.S. election is a big unknown there, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we'll see. And then of course there's the biggest unknowns in the sense of you know we still have the cope the pandemic. Are there going to be future waves? Are we ever going to get had a good testing? Are we going to get a therapy? Are we going to get a vaccine? All of that. But in, independent of that, China's continued rise. And preeminence in, in the global, in terms of global, the global economy, absolutely. The interesting countervailing force, in my view, is that you're going to have a diversification away from China in terms of global supply chain. It's not easy to do. It's way more complicated than U.S. You know, folks are talking about government. Oh, we're just going to bring it all back. Well, it, you know, you can't snap your fingers and bring right. <laughs> you're not going to bring the whole global supply chain back from China. Nonetheless, there will be continued pulling out uh, of and uh, attempts of diversifying away from China as the sort of the, the engine and the core of global supply chains. And so that actually is very interesting because I do agree uh, with Rebecca on everything she said about finance being more aggressive on the climate change front, global finance, mm -hmm. and companies more generally, and the supply chain. So it'll be very interesting to see whether that can be a virtuous, the moving away from China uh, in terms of global sort of supply chains and therefore risk management being, you know, that you were talking about, Rebecca, being better in terms of social and environmental factors being integrated to this diversified global supply chain. So, so there's two, but it's all revolves on China. And, and I think we just, how critical that is, you know, that dynamic is going to be in the next, you know, for the foreseeable future, but certainly in the next two to five years. How do you balance, I mean, in a world where China is becoming even more central and more powerful and brushing up against US interests even more. And there'll probably be more sort of neo Cold War talk and, 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 and bluster. Like how, how do you, how, how, if that's, if that's the environment we're heading to, right? Like more kind of great nation clashing, how, how do you build the necessary global institutions and cooperation we're gonna to need to prevent another crisis like this from happening? Well, Rebecca, if I could just jump in, because I think it's your argument, I completely, and it's the argument I'm making, I think we agree. Global business actually has to be a force for new global governance institutions. Let's take AI, right? Mm -hmm. We need desperately global governance around emerging technologies. Uh, we produced a white paper with the World Economic Forum on the global go governance of emerging technologies. Mm -hmm. We are so far from being able to regulate in an effective way to maximize the benefits and minimize the costs of all these cascading technologies, particularly AI. Global business, and particularly going back to the global tech companies that are gonna benefit, are benefiting from COVID and getting even stronger, they have to play a phenomenally important role. 
Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, all of these companies, Huawei, all of them. So that's going to, I think they have to play a leadership role, a global leadership role. Let, let me just jump on that, which is by saying, and I know this is not a guarantee of world peace, but we really need to globalize in order to deal with the big challenges that threaten the stability of the world's economy, not just AI, although governance of AI is absolutely critical, but also, forgive me, climate change. I'm a broken yeah, record. Absolutely. China, no, you know, absolutely. Chinese absolutely know that climate change is a huge problem, that they can't solve alone, that they must have global co cooperation. Um, at, at, at some level, we're going to be much more worried about future pandemics than we were. We're going to watch that. We're going to be worried about the economy. We know that trade is good for business. So I think there's at least a, a business case, or if you prefer, a strong alignment of interests. So I hope we could move to something that looks less like the Cold War and more like a kind of mutually careful regard. You know, where you don't trust each other, yeah. but you absolutely understand you need to work together. I know some marriages like that, right? So um, <laughs> we, we know that that's possible. I mean, trust, you're describing a marriage the way Reagan described the USSR. Trust well, but if I could continue that. on the family theme here, Jordan, I wanted to just bring in something else, which is, you know, I have three children, a 20-year-old, a 14-year-old, and a five-and-a-half-year-old, uh, now six-year-old stepdaughter. Now, before COVID, right, uh, uh, Rebecca, we were already talking about the war for talent and also how Gen Y, Gen Z, millennials, Gen Y, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z were, were really putting fundamental pressures on business and society uh, and government. Mm -hmm. The interesting question, you know, talking to my kids and obviously, you know, you know, for them, this is their, fun, you know, if you're talking about teenagers, this is their first fundamental global crisis, right? Yeah. They were too young during the global financial economic crisis. We already know that they're more environmentally conscious. They're more socially conscious. They're, you know, so forth. And, but they also don't, they're not big government fans. They're not big company fans. Mm -hmm. And so this, in my view, I, I would welcome Rebecca's thoughts and others, but it seems to me that that's only accelerated, going back to accelerating trends, that those young people are even less trustful of all these big institutions, are even more focused on these new kind of post-industrial uh, values. And so as the question is how active they become and in what way they become active. And that I don't, I feel like that's a crystal ball. It's hard, you know, it's hard to know if that, you know, if they jump into the elections, the U.S. elections, will this, is this a, a motivating thing for them to jump into the U.S. elections? I don't know. But could they? Possible. On the, on the private sector type, side, where do they want to work in the future? Or do they want to, this goes back to my point about more small and medium, I think they're going to just go entrepreneurial. They don't want to be part of those big companies. They want to do their own thing. It's, it's just going to further that, you know, Silicon Valley generation kind of thing. I don't know. Those are just speculations. But I do think that this whole demographic transformation is something we have, you know, going back to my global perspective, the average age of an African is 18 years old, right? 18 years old. And so we're talking a totally different demo, demo, demographics when you're talking about the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I, I have a final question that I want to ask each of you um, as we kind of hit, we're hit, hit, hitting our time limit. But you're, you're both educators. You're, you know, you're both at, at business schools. Is there one thing that this crisis is going to change how, or, or, or tell me, I guess, one thing that this is going to change that you teach? Right? Or is there like something that you teach students now that's going to change because of this crisis? Uh, Rebecca, l l you first. Is there anything that's going to change in your lessons that you're, that you want, you're going to be imparting differently to students in the future? I'm going to talk much more about risk yeah. and the impact of these large risks on business. Yeah. And I'm going to talk much more about government. Yeah. And why the knee-jerk reaction, which is we have nothing to do with government, we don't trust government, it never works, why that's wrong. So I would expect going forward to significantly increase the weight on just some basic ideas. Why free government makes free societies, the history of, you know, a little bit on the history of democracy. Um, and that's, that's not material we would have covered in depth before. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And, well, and, you know, I was at... 
the HBS for a long time, and I think we missed each other. I left way before you came. I'm sorry that I'm not there. Send my great regards to Deborah Spar and Nitin and all oh, the wonderful of course. colleagues there. I, you know, I miss everybody. They're fantastic. I'm such a big fan. Look, for us, we really charted it. A really, you know, Thunderbird's always been kind of a maverick global business school. It's, I'm sure Rebecca will confirm it. Part of the reason I got attracted to it. Entrepreneurial. Own, That's you know, the point. <laughs> Entrepreneurial. You know, you know, it just, you know, it was the first to really, and I think Rebecca would confirm this, to really do international business as, as a kind of core way of looking at the world. Um, and, and really what we've done since I've come is to take the very best of our past and really embrace the future. And what I mean by that is we, used, we, we have a master's of global management. We don't, we're not even doing an MBA as we used to do a master's of international management. And our magical diamond is global management, business skills, really understanding global affairs, international economics, international affairs, culture and languages, making sure every one of our students speaks a second language, is deeply ingrained in cross-cultural communications and negotiations, and then a big embracing of the 21st century. And there we connect two things. One is new technologies, the fourth industrial industry 4.0, whatever you want to call it. And the second is really a new commitment to su uh, sustainable and equitable prosperity and climate change and equity, all the things that Kat, you know, was been talking about. So that's everything we're doing in our programs, soup to nuts from our women at the bottom of the pyramid entrepreneurship programs, all the way to our executive programs. That's everything that we're focusing on. And COVID has only made it clear that we have to do even more of this. Yeah. More, more, glo more good globalization. More Can I have just a couple of sentences, Jordan? Yeah, sure. With all due respect, Dean, I think you cheated. Yeah. Because you were doing all that great stuff before. And, you know, if I get to tell you what we're going to accelerate, I was moved into the first year course on leadership and governance and ethics this year, yeah. specifically to teach more about what, how should government think, how should business think about the social contract? What does it mean to think of yourself embedded in this wider world? What does business leadership mean today? Yeah. So Fantastic. we have completely redone our first year course in response to these kinds of pressures. Yeah. Um, so. yeah. are, you redoing any, are you redoing any courses? Are you? Are you checking to Rebecca or are you checking or, to me? To, to you, are you redoing any courses? We right? actually fundamentally transformed our whole curriculum. Uh, two years ago when I came oh. in. Every single piece of it is towards this area. And so we're just like, just deepening what I know is happening. And, you know, we looked, I mean, what I'm, like I said, I'm a huge fan of HBS. I've had so many great colleagues. I've learned so much and continued to. All of us, business schools, management schools, leadership schools, we're, this is the way we must go. I, I'm sure you agree, uh, Rebecca. Absolutely. This is, it's our social contract. It's our social obligation to make sure that to, we do this. To be fair, everyone is moving. Everyone can see this. Yeah. It's absolutely central. We equip our MBAs for this new world. I think on that note, this has been a great conversation. Thank you, Rebecca, Sanjeev. Uh, this thank is you, Rebecca. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Sanjeev. It's a pleasure. Jordan, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, there are going to be more uh, future tense uh, social distancing socials to come every <laughs> Tuesday and Thursday. So on that note, goodbye and uh, thank you.